Tell us something about Jurgen and Paolo. Um, I first met him, what was it, three years ago with the Play for Agile in Germany where they, they do a conference similar to this one. We both, both groups got started around the same time, about three, four years ago, um, with the idea. And, uh, and Jurgen has written a book called Management 3.0. And the interesting thing is that, you know, a lot of people in the Agile community weren't directly addressing the role that managers ought to have in Agile. And uh, Jürgen's book is um, quite popular. And, uh, you know, I was asking him some things about, gee, how'd you, how'd you find time to really do all this? And he told me about his disciplined way of approaching it. So uh, I haven't achieved that level of uh, disciplined approach yet, Jürgen, but I'll keep working at it. Um, anyway, the book has a, it's written with a real sense of humor, and um, we'll see some of that, I think, in today's keynote. Uh, I, I, and another thing that you're going to help start is called, uh, people refer to it as the Stoos or Stoos movement. And I know some people here are kind of new to Agile, you spell it S-T-O-O-S, and it's named after a place in Switzerland where they had this initial meeting. And they local say Stoos. Yes. Oh, they, they say Stoos? Oh, excuse me, Stoos. Sorry. Well... Can't help being American, can we? <laughs> okay, so they um, they've started having meetings for these discussions in lots of different cities now, and more on a regular basis. And what kind of discussions are we talking about? Well, the role that managers ought to have in agile companies. So it, it's it's taking the idea beyond just software teams or technical teams delivering things, and what does it take to properly support that way of working? So without too much more here, why don't I turn it over to Jürgen and Paolo? Okay. All right, thank you. I'm going to turn this off, and it's all yours. Good. Um, so uh, yes, my name is, is Jürgen Apollo. I am from the Netherlands. I'm sorry about that. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> and now I have to do that. I, I usually do that because uh, um, the Dutch pay, the Dutch people are famous for being for being honest uh, about their thoughts. Like normal people. Normal people have this, this thing in their brains that, that filters whatever they think before it escapes their mouths. And the Dutch people, for some reason, a couple of centuries ago or more, it got stripped out of their DNA. <laughs> so uh, among, in, among the Europeans, we are known as the rude guys. I know that because I'm in Brussels. I work with all those. Uh, I know many, many people from other, other countries. And uh, to just... One example, there's an expression that many, that many cultures have, many people have, like uh, stepping on someone's toes, it means to offend them, right? We have the opposite expression. We say whenever somebody's offended, oh, oh, they have long toes. <laughs> <laughs> Can't avoid stepping on them. <laughs> I'm serious, not, I'm not making this up. <laughs> so we have an entirely different perspective on it. You might notice that every now and then during this, uh, during this talk. So um, I started uh, in the Agile world, sort of, with, with this blog, noob.nl. And uh, I, uh, I did that to, to, to write a book. Because I tried writing a book twice, and I completely failed in 2000, 2005, uh, doing them as, as big projects. Uh, and uh, after about 40, 50 pages, I didn't know how to proceed. Then I thought, Maybe I should do this in a more agile way, or a novel approach. So uh, I thought I should do it as, as a blog, write small pieces of text, and then get a feedback cycle going. So I wrote some blog posts, and I got some compliments, some criticism, and both of them really got me all fired up, and write the next one, and wait eagerly for the, for the replies. And then after a while, it turned out that people wanted me to write more about management. I had a different idea. I wanted to write a book about complexity science and software engineering, big topics. But people said, yeah, 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 that's all very interesting. But can you tell us more about management? Because I was a manager at, at a company, uh, ISM, a small company in the Netherlands. We make websites for big Dutch customers. You might have heard of the name Heineken, perhaps. <laughs> Whatever. That was one of our customers, a very difficult one, I can tell you. Um, so I learned how to be, uh, I tried to, to learn how to be a manager. The, I, I flipped back and through the pages of the Scrum books and nowhere could I find the description of the chief information officer. It was not there, so I had to invent uh, my, my own contribution. So I wrote about that and that turned into this book, Management 3.0. And uh, indeed, uh, the publisher is happy with it, so I suppose I should be happy with it as well. 
uh, How to Change the World. There's a tiny, tiny book, a little book that I sort of published in a self-publishing experiment because people asked me to write uh, 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 more about change management, how to introduce ideas. So because I became agile as a writer, I think I am now a bit more successful than I was in the past because I started to listen and learn what people really want me to write about. I do courses all over the world. I just came from Japan and Turkey and the next stops will be, be Italy. I was in Poland and Canada and Australia. It's a lot of fun. A lot of traveling that I do, keep loose, loose tablet computers everywhere in the world. <laughs> and uh, I, I call myself the global bumblebee. Uh, I, I pick up ideas from many different sources and have this 30,000 feet view over the world. I'm not a consultant or a coach. I insist I am not a consultant or a coach. I just look at what people are doing and share ideas that I pick up from many sources. You will, uh, you will hear a couple of them later on. This is my most favorite slide. This, is, uh, this was published on InfoQ last, uh, last year. According to someone, these are the most influential people in Agile, based on, on book sales and blog readers or, or whatever. And number one is Mike Cohn and Ken Schwaber of Scrum fame and Bob Martin. You know all those names, of course. Martin Fowler, XP, David Anderson, Cameron. And look at who is here. Oh, I was so happy when I saw that. <laughs> Woo -hoo, that really made my day. I did a, did a little European dance. <laughs> Now, you, you shouldn't take that too serious. I have this in quotes intentionally. I know how the data was produced. And, uh, you shouldn't take it too serious. <laughs> there are only 10 people in the world who take this list serious, so they're all listening. <laughs> <laughs> all right, just to keep the, the right perspective here. Okay, let's get started. This is Melly. Pretend that Melly is your colleague. Uh, Melly is, is, is working at the same company where you are, and she's always smiling over her shoulder when you pass by, and you think, Melly is doing a good job. She's probably enjoying working here. Always, always smiling friendly. Well, actually, no. Melly Shum hates her job. This is a, a billboard, meters or f many feet wide, I should say here, uh, in, in my hometown, Rotterdam in the Netherlands, and it's been hanging out for 20 years. It's apparently a work of art. I don't know what's so arty-party about a, a picture like this, but anyways, I'm not an art lover. So this is, uh, this is a work of art. And for 20 years I've been wondering, why is Melly hating her job? Why doesn't she quit, for God's sake? Go somewhere else. But no, she just sits there, smiling, hating her job. I have friends like that. I'm friend, my, one of my best friends, she keeps telling me that she hates her job. But she doesn't quit because she has to pay for the mortgage and all kinds of other excuses that she comes up with while I keep telling her, just quit your job, go somewhere else. But apparently that's difficult and, and that sort of bothers me. I want people to be happier in their jobs. And actually, half of American workers effectively hate their jobs. In Europe I make a bad joke about Americans at this point. I won't do that now. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> no, no, this was it, this was it. Yeah. So, um, now actually, the, the, the numbers are worldwide. Uh, Gary Hamill has the same figures uh, in his book, What Matters Now, with the global, global statistics. Same everywhere. People not feeling engaged. So, suppose, imagine this is you. This is actually my cousin Eric. He has a funny face. I have his permission to use his photograph. <laughs> but imagine that this is you. And you tell Melly, we cannot go on like this. We have to be happier in our jobs. We have to do something about it. Maybe. We will be happier if we perform better. If we perform better. And some people say, we can help with that. We have some good ideas. We see the organization as a machine. Something that we can improve by improving all the little parts. I call that management 1.0, by the way. That's my metaphor for it. The scientific management, uh, some people use the word uh, Taylorism. Some flavors of project management. Structured programming, as I have been taught in the 80s of last century. We tried to create robots that would be able to write software so that we would not be have to write software anymore and would just be able to read books and other more interesting stuff. So that's a very, very structured approach to, to programming, very machine-like. And the idea is you all play a part in the whole, uh, in the whole construction. Uh, you all try to improve your own performance in, and, and, and do better. Like, uh, like uh, um, uh, uh, performance appraisals, for example. Uh, in, uh, let's, 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 uh, let's assume that we have a, a sticky note factory. I have a sticky note factory. 
and I have several people who are working for me. This is Jason. Hi, Jason. Nice to meet you. You're working in my factory, and uh, you paint sticky notes. Right. Yellow, blue, green, pink, yellow. A lot of yellow, by the way. There's a huge amount for yellow. I don't know why, but yellow is important. But the other colors as well, all right? You're the sticky note painter. And we have someone else here. Let's see. Brian. Brian, you have a very responsible job. You put the glue on. That's the whole point of the sticky notes, right? Sticky note. Glue on, on, on one side, by the way, not the other one. That make, doesn't make much sense. So, very responsible job. We have a painter and a gluer, and we have someone in the middle, Nancy. Ooh, I'm hiring you to run up and down. <laughs> run up and down between the painter and the gluer. It's a very responsible job, right? Very responsible job. And at the end of the year, I will have a performance appraisal. And we'll, I will ask each of you uh, how you're doing, and I will rate you individually on how fast you run, how fast you paint, and how fast you glue. This is management 1.0. Assuming if everyone does a better job, we will be happier together. Right? We will have a, a better business. Interestingly enough, it doesn't work. Good idea, interesting idea, but it doesn't really work. 70% of all strategies and projects fail, according to Fortune uh, magazine. So, we need another approach. We're still not happy, I hear you say to, to Mali. Maybe we should, uh, maybe should, maybe we should work toward a greater purpose. And, uh, and see, uh, see ourselves as a team. Some people say we can help with that. We, we, we use team sports, some people say, uh, in order to describe organizations. Lots of, lots of American uh, management literature has these references to famous baseball coaches, right? That, that, and then these should be the inspiring examples for, for, for teams in organizations. Let's work together and beat the competition. Kick their ass. We have to win. Uh, as compared to the, to the others. Well, the metaphor might do, work a bit better than the previous one, but I still have some problems there. Uh, I think this is the underlying metaphor of Six Sigma, theory of constraints, total quality management, business process re-engineering, etc., etc., etc. Lots of ideas out there. And the ideas were not that bad. There were actually some smart people behind them. But I think they used the wrong metaphor. Um, the metaphor uh, of, 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 of the organization being like a sports team and trying to win and we have to change for the greater good of the, the whole organization has to win. That is the whole, whole uh, issue here. So, for example, Nancy says uh, uh, we, uh, we have to do better. We have to do better because the customer is, 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 has a lot of complaints. The sticky notes don't, pull, uh, don't, don't stick to the windows well. Apparently they're using glass uh, windows like the ones over or here like glass walls. And the glue is not good enough. Sorry, Brian. Sorry. The glue. We need better glue. And uh, and uh, the, so all kinds of problems. And at some point, uh, 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 Jason is complaining that Nancy is not uh, running fast enough. Sorry, Nancy. But we need to have a talk about that anyway. <laughs> during our performance appraisal, because the ticky notes just pile up in his office over there. And Brian, at some point, was waiting. So, but no problem. I have a solution. I give you Silvana. No, she will now be Mini Nancy. <laughs> Mini Nancy and Nancy. That makes your manager right away. That makes your manager. Oh, I made your manager. <laughs> so Nancy and Mini Nancy, they run up and down between between Jason and and, and and Ryan, trying to do better. I just discovered the bottleneck, by the way. That would that would be theory of constraints, right? That would be theory of constraints. Um, and uh, but yeah, Jason said we can do even better. What if I? What if if Nancy holds up the sticky note? Well, I paint it on one side, and then Brian puts the glue on on the other side. And then Silvana switches it at the right moment. We now have reorganized our business process, re-engineered our business process, business process re-engineering. Aren't you all happy now? <laughs> this is an amazing organization that we work for. This is the kind of metaphor that they use, trying to do better as a, as a team. But does it really make me people happier? I don't think so. These fads and fascists fail to deliver on the promises, and uh, they, come, they, they have a short life cycle, a rapid decline. At the same time, the world's getting more complex. We have uh, globalization going up, innovation going up, democratization going up, diversification, all kinds of Asians, it's all going up. It's amazing. It's, it's a very uncertain world out there. Less and less we know about what is going to happen, uh, happen tomorrow. Until and the value exchanges with the environment, it changes from day to day, until the whole environment fails. 
I worked for the whole night on this animation. I hope you like it. <laughs> I'm not going to make another one, I can tell you. <laughs> so, um, more and more uncertainty. I hear you think, all right, this is very interesting, Jürgen, but what do we do about that? We have to become happier still. We're still not happy. And at the same time, we have to increase our health as an organization because the environment is getting less and less certain. And only healthy, environment, healthy organizations can thrive. In, in uncertain environments. Well, some people said we can help with that. And now we come to management 3.0. The previous one was 2.0, as, as I always say. Good idea, but still not use, not the right metaphor. Now we're going to use the metaphor of the community. A team is a community, a, a company is a community, the industry as a whole is a community, and there's competition and collaboration at all scales. Within a team, people collaborate, but they buy for the same job promotion, job positions, and, and parking lots near to the, to the door. Uh, at, the, at the company, at the industry uh, scale, uh, Apple is a competitor of, of Samsung, but also one of their most important customers. This is very complex, actually, the world that we're living in. So it's a community of people competing and collaborating at the same time, on all levels. It's fractal. It makes sense. And I think this is a metaphor that is sometimes uh, subconsciously used in Agile, Scrum, and all the, all the great ideas that we're working with nowadays. The philosophy is you do whatever you, uh, whatever you want, but what you do has to somehow contribute to the community that you feel part of. At the same time, it works the other way around. The community has to recognize that you are you, in it for your own reasons, you have your own goals, and you want to be a happier person. So, for example, instead of, uh, <clears throat> instead of, uh, of having sticky notes, Jason comes up with the idea, maybe we, should, maybe we should go to where the customer is trying to use our sticky notes. Let's, let's see where the customer is, is using our product. So, the four of you go to the customer, and then you see the, 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 the hallways are full of sticky notes. It looks like autumn. They don't really stick well to the windows, and it's, they need more sticky notes, and it's a big mess. And Nancy says, why don't we get rid of the sticky notes altogether? Why don't we create tiny little whiteboards where people can write on? And then, and then Brian says, oh, I know someone who, can, who has these little suction cups. So we can we got, put them on the window and then put the whiteboards on. And, and Silvana says, oh, I can drill the holes. I'm good at drilling holes. So I can drill the holes in a little whiteboard. And, uh, and then, we have, then we have a task board that really sucks. <laughs> <laughs> And they have a task board like this. I took this picture at a company in, in Rotterdam. Uh, some of my friends uh, work there. They, made, they came up with this themselves. The Scrum team came up with it themselves. They want to get rid of the sticky notes. And it looks fabulous. They have a wonderful looking office. People go there they, to, that, to that company just to look at their amazing task boards. And at the end of the, at, at the, end of the week, they, they wash all the dishes, but, but they have whiteboards instead of the dishes. And then they start a new sprint and all the whiteboards go to the start of the, 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 the left part of the windows again. It looks awesome. And this is innovation. This is a happy team enjoying their jobs. So these are the benefits obtained from Agile. Managing change, dealing with changing environments, uh, but also happier people, number four. Improve team morale. It works. It actually works. At the same time, we can also get increased productivity and faster time to market. Ooh, isn't that nice? That is what managers want, don't they? Have them do more in less time. Well, we can. If we do it well, we can have our cake and eat it. We can have it all. So it is possible. But we have different community leaders, different people suggesting different things. How many scrummers do we have? Let's see some hands. None. How many scrummers? Woo! -hoo! Amazing. Good. So I'm not going to explain what scrum is in this audience. Uh, but for me, the core of Scrum, despite all the nice rituals like planning poker and, and, and stand-ups, etc., the core is, for me, delivering stuff in small increments. To hear as soon as possible what the customer really wants, as I did with my blog. I wrote entirely the, the wrong book twice, until I started delivering stuff in small increments, and then the customer told me, yeah, 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 but that's not what we want. We want you to write a management book. That worked. So that is... I think being, uh, being agile as a, as a writer too. How many can manners do we have? Let's see some hands. Is it the same number or less? 
Usually it's a little bit less, but almost the same. Okay, good, good, all right. Same philosophy as far as I'm concerned. Differences in the detail. Instead of, instead of a time box of, of uh, uh, where you limit the amount of work, you limit them vertically per, per column. No more than a certain number of sticky notes, and you decide how, how many per, uh, per column. The end result is the same. You deliver as fast as possible to the customer to get a feedback cycle going. But is anyone familiar with Beyond Budgeting? Can I see some hands? Five, six, seven, or seven-ish hands. All right. All right. OK. They made a start. Good. This is a, this is a Scandinavian idea. Uh, there's a Beyond Budgeting Roundtable. Uh, some very smart people from, from finance departments getting together, and they, they came up with, with some very common sense ideas like, let's get rid of the budgets. Budgets don't make sense anymore nowadays in this world, because the world is changing too fast. It doesn't make sense to say, next year we're going to sell one million units. How do you know? There could be the next horse meat scandal or, or, or whatever that, that we will all be suffering from and that will, uh, uh, that will have our sales uh, collapse. So um, uh, they say uh, you, should, uh, you should try something else, like transparency, for example. Transparency of all the expenses. Because the, the, one of the goals of, of budget is to make sure that departments don't spend more money than they are allowed to. Well, <coughs> Uh, the Beyond Budgeting guys say, uh, make things transparent. If you want to fly business class to attend conferences and uh, across the across the Atlantic, all right, go ahead, spend spend the money, but everyone will see it, and you will have to be able to defend your expenses. You want a new computer, go ahead, buy it, but it will be on your on your track record, so and everyone can look it up. So it turns out where they implement this at Statoil and Handelsbanken and several other big companies in, in Scandinavia, expenses go down. They don't go up, they go down, interestingly enough. No budgets anymore. Uh, when I told this in Italy, people started laughing, interestingly enough. <laughs> they said, oh, you're, that's not going to work here, my Italian friends uh, said, because <laughs> we have a different culture. Uh, the Italians feel proud when they spend the most money. <laughs> they feel this confirms their status. <laughs> so um, that's what they told me. I'm just, I'm just uh, re rephrasing their words here. Uh, so you might need a different approach depending on the, on the culture. But get rid of the, of the budget. That makes, makes sense to me. Another interesting idea, Lean Startup. Anyone uh, familiar? Anyone read the book? Good. Wow. As many as those promised. Good. I think there's one thing added to, to agile thinking here with the Lean Startup movement which is validate as soon as possible that you can get a revenue stream going, which is sort of implied, never explicitly addressed in Agile. It is assumed that you have a paying customer. Uh, but then it goes wrong when you have a startup, move, a startup and you don't have customers yet. So I created working software once. The Agile Manifesto says working software over comprehensive documentation. I created working software 20 years ago. And after 20 years of heavy use, I found only three bugs. I think that's pretty good. 30,000 lines of code that I wrote by myself when I was a student. There's just one small problem, is that nobody else in the world is using my software. <laughs> I'm the only one. So Eric Ries of Lean Startup, uh, Lean Startup book would say, you're an idiot, Jürgen. If he was Dutch, he would say it like that probably. That, like that, probably. Uh, you're an idiot. You wasted two years of your life creating something that nobody wants. You should have stopped after one or two weeks validating that somebody wants to pay for it. Makes sense to me. Another example is design thinking. Anyone familiar with the word design thinking? Good, good. Mm, about a quarter of the hands I saw go up. Okay, so one thing that I found interesting is, is that 10 years before the Agile Manifesto, some people came up with, with, uh, uh, with the principles of design thinking. Uh, they are uh, work with cross-functional teams, like sociologists, psychologists, biologists, Different with people with different perspectives. That makes sense. Um, go to where the customer is using your product. Like, try to understand your product from the customer's point of view. What would they want by being the customer, actually? Uh, and third, iterate, 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 iterate with prototypes, mocking, etc. That sounds suspiciously like Agile to me. Only 10 years before we used the word Agile in the Agile community. With the early articles of, of design thinking are from the 80s of last century. 
I think it will all make sense. So I sometimes say I am not particularly married to the word agile. I think it's useful. It's a brand that I feel positive about. But whether it's agile or lean or beyond budgeting or design thinking or scrum or Kanban or whatever, they're all happy brothers and sisters in the same family. It's a dysfunctional family every now and then. They fight with each other, but hey, that happens in the best, right? in the best families. They share the same DNA. DNA is from compact complexity thinking and, 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 and systems theory. That is, uh, that is where they got the DNA from. That's what the parents are. All right, we're making progress. But, Houston, we have a problem. These are the biggest barriers to agile adoption. From, again, from the state of agile survey. New one is out, by the way, uh, um, half, uh, a, couple of, uh, a couple of weeks ago. But results are still more or less the same. The ability to change the organization's culture, biggest problem. Uh, people with the right skills not available. Change management, number three. Managers thinking that Scrum is something some developers do in their caves without understanding that they have to support them somehow. And then some other stuff. I think the top four is all management stuff. It's management stuff that is not done well. So management is the obstacle. And I can sympathize. Some people say we should get rid of managers. Let's put them on the list of impediments. Get rid of them. We are a self-organizing team. We don't need them anymore. Wow. That is a bit going too far. I think. That's like throwing out the baby with the bathwater. We need better management. And I think we can do better when we really understand complexity thinking. Let's give you a couple of examples. What the, what, what the, what the parents' DNA is. Uh, there's a law called the law of requisite variety. It is, uh, according to some system thinkers, it is as important to managers as the law of relativity to physics. The law of requisite variety. It says, in, uh, uh, according to this, uh, this text, the complexity of a system must be adequate to the complexity of the environment that it finds itself in. Or, in other words, if you have a system that's trying to survive, like your organization, it has to have at least the complexity of the environment in which it is trying to survive. Because if it is less complex, at some point the environment will kill it. It will do something that it is unable to deal with because it lacks the required complexity, the requisite complexity. So that is where the law of requisite variety or law of requisite complexity comes from. So how do you do that? How do you make sure that there is enough complexity in the organization? Well. There's already plenty of it. I, I, see, I see a lot of heads here in the room, and I assume most of them contain brains. I think it's relatively safe here in the US, right? particularly in Boston. <laughs> so there's a huge amount of complexity here. The problem is many organizations have been switching those brains off, replacing them with rules and policies and procedures which can never have the required complexity to deal with the complex environment. They should help the human brain instead of replacing the human brain. That is something that we have all also realized in the Agile world. Uh, for example, uh, uh, we should all use all kinds of mechanisms that stimulate the human brain to solve problems. Uh, storytelling, visualization, narration. Uh, we, we now describe, uh, write user requirements with, with personas and, and stories instead of flowcharts which would be easier to consume by computers than, than human beings. So this is an implementation of the law of requisite complexity. It makes sense from a scientific perspective. Let the human brain do the thinking and not a, 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 couple of, a couple of computers to understand the complex environment. Here's another example. Anticipate, adapt, and explore. Three ways for systems to survive in complex environments. Anticipate is looking ahead. Adapting is looking backwards and changing according to feedback. But explore is something that we sometimes forget. Exploration. Trying things out. We're not anticipating that it works well. We have absolutely no clue. Or just look around. Uh, explore the landscape. And this is something that many teams often forget, I know. Because on Scrum teams, they anticipate the next sprint and they adapt uh, in, the, in the retrospective. But when is there time for experiments? <laughs> that nobody knows will do any good, but we're going to try them anyway, so that we see what the landscape is. The product owner didn't even ask for it. Well, screw him. We're going to do it. Right. Sort of. Yeah. So this exploration. In, in, in extreme programming, uh, they, they have spikes as 
architectural <coughs> experiments. That is an example of, of what you could be doing, right? The architectural experiments. Next one, steel and tweak. There, uh, some researchers had uh, virtual systems compete against each other on computers, and then they measured how much time these systems evolved, uh, how much that time they spent innovating uh, while they were evolving. And it turned out these virtual competing systems were spending 95% stealing practices from the others. What works for you is probably also going to work for me. So let's copy it and then uh, see if I tweak it a little, can tweak it a little bit. I sometimes call it the Samsung method. <laughs> it can be very, very effective. Right? If you're good at copying and tweaking, then this is the best return on investment. You already know that it works for others, so why don't you do better uh, and change it to your own circumstances? So real innovation, really new ideas, they're actually quite rare. Just copy stuff and, and rewire them in new combinations. That is innovation too. I call it and, steal and tweak. Uh, uh, as well. So I have an example from my own courses. I found that evaluation forms after two days are too late. I want to know earlier what people think of, of, of being on my courses. So I started asking after lunch on the first day, could you drop some sticky notes on the door before you go out and, and write something on it? Oh, and by the way, the higher you put them, uh, is, is, uh, uh, the, the height at which you put them is in the reflection of your, of your happiness. So basically it's a combination of happiness index and the feedback wall. I stole two ideas that were already working, and it turned out people love them. It's easy, they can write some anonymous feedback on it and quickly uh, put it on the door when I'm intentionally looking the other way. And for me, it's a very, very simple and effective fast feedback method. This is innovation too. You use them at conferences and, and in classrooms. People tell me they've used them at meetings. When you leave the meeting, can you put some feedback on the door so I know how to improve the meeting? It makes sense to me. And the last one, shorten the feedback cycle. Last example. There's, a, there's proof, scientific proof, that when the environment, when environments were stable over geological time, species got bigger. Because there's an evolutionary advantage to being big. You can bully the others, basically, right? And fight for food, and the best mates, and stuff like that. But when, there were, when the, the environment changed, with ice ages starting and stopping and things like that, then species got smaller. Because there was rapid change and species needed to evolve faster. And small species evolve faster than big ones. That is why we don't have that many big animals anymore. Now, the environment is changing too fast. Same in business. It is now better to be small than to be big. You need fast feedback cycles. The only way to, live, win, way to win is to learn faster than anyone else. Some people say, how do you, how do you explain it like, how do you escape the attack of a bear? Well, run faster than your friend. That's how you escape the attack of a bear. Canadians know all about that, I'm quite sure. So, this is, uh, this is important. You learn faster than, than, than anyone else, as Eric, Eric Ries said. Shorten the feedback cycle. It, uh, there's proof in, in science that that's uh, important. Even within the Agile world, we have speeded up the feedback cycle. Everyone knows, uh, many of you know probably that Scrum was defined as four-week sprints only ten years ago. Something like that, ten years ago. Nowadays, we wonder, we, we wonder if someone says four-week sprints, hmm, wow, interesting, there's still a four-week sprints. That's, vi that's vintage Scrum. <laughs> We're at, we're at one week sprints. We deploy, we deploy every day. That's even faster. So even within the agile world, we have been accelerating things. So these, these are just four examples. Visualize stuff, explore uh, every now and then, uh, innovate by stealing and tweaking, iterate all the time. What kind of, what kind of activity can you, can you imagine that is typical, that basic does all of this? Game. But by playing games, we usually visualize things, we share stories about some kind of, uh, kind of topic, whether it is playing Monopoly or Risk or, 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 or whatever. We explore strategies and, and experiment with, would this work? Uh, my, 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 my familiar strategies have been failing in the past. We try to innovate by stealing and tweaking. We see someone else do something, so we copy it and try to improve on their strategies. And we iterate all the time because we keep playing the games. This, this is why gamification works. It does all of this. 
uh, what, what the scientists have been, have been doing, have been promoting. So, how can we solve the remaining problems? We have a management problem, I, uh, I, I told you. I call, it, uh, I call my next project management workouts. I like the metaphor. Metaphors are important. I don't like the metaphors like, like frameworks and, and methods because they have a, a rigid, a rigid uh, sound uh, to them, rigid uh, uh, affinity uh, for, for some. So I like workouts, healthy workouts for organizations. And I'm looking for healthy practices from all over the world that help management be more, be more healthy, help uh, organizations be more healthy. And uh, here's a quote uh, that I picked up from uh, Dave Snowden and Cynthia Kurtz. They said the verb, the verb to manage is from the Italian word manageare. I like that. It's taking care of horses. That is what management originally is. Taking care of horses. Now, some organizations are like big, sturdy horses that pull carts full of vegetables or fat tourists or something like that. Other, 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 horses, other horses are like racing horses. They have to win at the races. Maybe some organizations are like My Little Pony. I don't know about your organization. <laughs> different organizations, different horses, but they all need to be managed. They're all living systems, we have to nurture them, we have to feed them, we have to love them. Hopefully they love us back, so they do what we want. But basically they do whatever they want, they want, right? With their self-organizing system. So I think it's a great metaphor. Another quote that I like is by Peter Drucker. He said, management is all about human beings. Individuals and interactions over process and tools. And his task is to make people capable of joint performance, and this is the reason why management is the critical determining factor. Management is the critical determining factor. Interesting, isn't it, that we've been doing Agile for 10 years or more, and now we found out, oh, we run up against all these management problems. Well, if Peter Drucker would have been around today, he would have said, duh. Because <laughs> he wrote this 30 or 40 years ago. Right? So, uh, it's not really new, this, 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 this insight. Uh, if, we, if we ignore the management stuff, yes, it will be... It will be a problem. It is critical in Germany, factor. But, he said, management is critical. Not managers. Subtle bit detail. Subtle difference, right? I compare it with testing. Is testing important? Of course, testing is important. You would be an idiot if you're not testing. Do you need testers? That depends. Depends on your organization, or whether people want to specialize in it, if it's really difficult, or whatever. That depends on the environment. But testing, hey, we all do that. Maybe some people specialize in it, they do a bit more of it than the others. But everyone is responsible. If your product is crappy, do you blame just the testers for not testing it well? I hope not. Everyone is responsible for good testing. So, management, same. Do we need management? Of course we need management. It's critical, determining factor. Do we need managers? I don't know. That's up to you. Whether you have people specializing in it, it's a pretty tough job, I can tell you. It's quite difficult. It's very different from writing, writing software, working with human beings. So uh, it is difficult. So maybe some people specialize in it. We call them managers. That's not, a, that's not an issue. That's fine. But the issue is, if the organization is bad, do we blame the managers? Many people nod their heads. Well, that would be wrong, I would say. Everyone is responsible for management. Everyone is, is, is responsible. So, management is too important to leave to the managers. That is my conclusion. We all participate in, the, in this workout. We all have to learn how to do better. So, I'll give you a few examples, and you will, you will recognize some gameplay along the, along the way in various, uh, various of these ideas. This is, this is Marty, by the way. This is my management model. I was a bit, uh, bit tired of all the squares and rectangles and circles that I, saw, <laughs> that I saw in many of the other management books. So I thought, let's come up with something more fashionable. This is the Justin Bieber among the management models. <laughs> and uh, Marty has six eyes on the organization. The first one, energize people. Make sure they are active and creative and motivated, that they love doing their jobs. Here's an example. The kudo cards, the kudo box. This is uh, an idea that I picked up from a company in Poland, uh, but they use it elsewhere as well. Uh, the CEO told me, everyone in our organization can get compliments from others by simply writing, it, writing the compliment on a card. 
And then uh, the person who gets the card gets a little present from the CEO, like a, a movie ticket, a, a, a dinner for two, chocolates, whatever. They can choose. And he said, this totally changed the culture in the organization. We emphasize the good things that are happening instead of the bad things. Typical system thinking. If you, you get more of what you focus on. If you focus on bad things, you might get more bad things. If you focus on good things, you could get more good things. So let's focus on the good stuff. We just have to incentivize people a little bit to focus on the, on the good stuff. And it works for them. At the Zappos, they call them wows. They give each other wows. At Linden Labs, uh, creator Second Life, they call them the love system. I'm not entirely sure about that name, but anyways. Uh, and it works for them. So let's practice that right now. I have here a little book, a little present, and a kudo card. Ah, great job, great job. So I'm going to write now, and we're to Nancy. Thanks for running the conference for me. Everyone, everyone else is, of course, yeah, but I will see what my contact, so forgive me here. I just have one card. I cannot write 20 already. Thanks for running the conference for me. For me, sorry about being a difficult prick. <laughs> Love, Jurnan. <laughs> All right. So this is for you, Nancy. <laughs> So I put it into practice. I put it in practice. That's the kudo card. Uh, you can bring, you can extend it even with uh, when you include the bonus system. There are companies that have alternative ways of distributing bonuses, and uh, what they do with some companies is they split the bonus money equally among everyone. Everyone gets an equal split, but on one condition: you cannot keep it yourself. You have to give it to others. And then every person can decide for themselves what they believe performance means or contribution to the corporate goal. And if, if Silvana helped me out last month because I was feeling depressed, because Nancy had killed my Tamagotchi, and I, and I almost quit my job, and you pulled me through, thank you for that, I give you half of my bonus. And the rest I split equally among everyone, except Nancy. <laughs> I can do that. Right? That's my prerogative. I can do that. And anyone else can have a similar, a similar approach, but in different ways. And this is, this is how you use the complexity of all the brains in the organization. There's no KPI in the world who can come up with such, uh, such conclusions. It works for, for those companies. Another example, Empower Teams. Uh, this is about delegation. Uh, very briefly, because we're going to do a, a game uh, about this uh, afterwards. But uh, this is about visualizing delegating things. We have realized that if workflow is an issue, well, why, why don't we visualize it and put it on the wall? If that makes sense, they will have self-organizing teams stand around it and, and, uh, and uh, uh, improve the workflow. Well, if delegation is a problem, if management is struggling with delegating things, why don't we visualize it then? And then have delegation levels horizontally, key decision areas vertically, like for example, who is, who is putting key, uh, team, uh, team members on teams? Team membership could be one of the uh, rows here. And then we decide, is that the manager job, is that the team job, or is it somewhere in between? But simply visualizing it, things become much more clear. The horse will finally see the fence. That is important. It should not run into invisibly, invisible electric fences, as, uh, as Donald Ryanson says. Make it clear what the boundaries are of self-organization. So um, that's, uh, that's the next one. Another one, line constraints. This is uh, about uh, uh, sending the horse in the right direction. And in that case, it can really help if, if people feel part of an identity, feel part of a community. And the team is a community, the organization is a community, but people can only feel part of a community if that community has an identity that works for them. So I always suggest to managers that they invite teams to come up with their, with their own names, for example. Uh, here's an example of a picture I took at a company in, in Berlin where the company is called ResearchGate, the website for researchers and, and scientists. 
and uh, the teams come up with names, and there's a constraint there. The name has has to have an R and a G in it for research gate. That's the constraint, just for fun. So they come up with names like the gummy bears, Synergy, Superglue. The design team is still thinking about the names. We all know how designers are. That can take ages. <laughs> Vorsprung, German word. Uh, the, the system administrators call themselves the Borg, obviously. No surprise there. And, uh, and it works for them. And they have fun coming up with their own names and even logos in some, in some cases. I also suggest that teams create their own little expositions. Uh, I've been at organizations where, where they use storytelling and, and artifacts that, that represent what they are here for, that express their identity. It works much better than boring mission statements. Uh, we create high quality products and that uh, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. That it's not compelling. No, some companies have, have uh, uh, visual, uh, visual stories. I started intentionally with a, with a photo of Melly who hates her job. That has an impact on people. I noticed that already. Some people tell me, yeah, I've been a Melly in the past, or I know some Melly. My, my, my sister is a Melly. That it, 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 it invites the human brain to do a bit, a bit more thinking. So storytelling, visualization, very important. Develop competence. Here's another uh, example where we see gameplay uh, emerge. This is a picture that I took at a company in Norway, uh, uh, in Oslo, Cisco Systems, formerly called uh, Tanberg. And um, uh, this, is their, this is their football table, soccer table, as you would call it, uh, call it here. Um, and Ove, the guy who showed me around, said, uh, uh, oh, by the way, th this is a company that is specialized in high-end uh, conference call stuff. Companies called equipment, TVs, microphones, all that stuff. The biggest companies in the world use their products to have meetings across the globe. So very, very technical people. And the guy who showed me around showed me the, their, their soccer table. And he said, we installed a laser beam here in the goal. I'm showing you the laser beam with my laser beam. So this is sort of a fractal laser beam that we have here now. So it's, it went up in a bit faster than I can do here. Uh, and the laser beam detects when the score is being, uh, uh, is being made. At the same time, they, uh, they inserted a counter here. So the table counts the number of, uh, of goals that were scored. What they also did was they attached a security card swiper here <laughs> in, the, in the top corner. So the passes that people use to get access to the building, they also use to get access to the table. So the table knows who's playing. And they said that there's software that keeps track of, the, of, the, of, the, <laughs> of all the games that we play uh, together. It's awesome. And they said the next thing that we're working on is we want to have a tiny camera here so that we can replay the best goals in slow motion on television screen. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> I love it. And this is a team having fun. And they're playing. And they are innovating. And he said that's the point. Management allows us any time we want uh, to play with, with, that, with that football table or soccer table. And he said to me, and, and, and I agreed, agreed there, he said to me, some organizations have these, have these corners with colorful wallpaper and cushions and, and comfortable chairs where people can sit and are expected to have an innovative idea. <laughs> Nothing comes to mind right now. <laughs> so he said it doesn't work. It doesn't work creating a, a fluffy, colorful looking environment. No, people have an innovative idea when they're playing, when they're experimenting, when they're challenging each other to come up with something that's even weirder than the, the previous one came up with. For them, it is their, it is their soccer table. Great example. Um, another thing, another uh, experiment, another um, uh, practice that many of you probably know about is uh, FedEx Days. Who has heard of the FedEx Days? Many hands go up. All right, good. So this is a software vendor in, in Australia, Atlassian. They came up with the idea, with the idea of, of, uh, of uh, reserving one day every three months, every quarter or so. Everyone, everyone uh, drops their work and they just learn for 24 hours. And then they deliver the results. That is the requirement, that the constraint. You have to show the results after 24 hours. That's why they called it FedEx Days. Uh, the practice became so popular, particularly after Daniel Pink wrote about it in his book, Drive, that FedEx started complaining <laughs> a couple of months ago. Not really. Yeah. They, they said, uh, well, this is all very nice, but uh, 
probably they were getting calls from people asking, how do you organize a FedEx day? <laughs> so, this is not us. You're using our name. So they kindly asked Atlassian to come up with a different name, and they call them Ship It Days now. And I don't like that, to be honest. Because then the emphasis becomes on shipping things, and it's not the point. The point is learning, as far as I'm concerned. Experimentation, as the science says. Uh, exploring the landscape, so I prefer to call them exploration days, or as some people say, innovation days, also fine. I think that's better than shipping days, but that's, that's my pr personal preference. At least, the takeaway here is, uh, it is fun, again, it's a game, because you can win, uh, there are incentives for the best idea that people come up, with, come up with, so again, you see gameplay here. And uh, the names can, can be important that you, that you choose. At Facebook they call them hackathons, at Spotify they call them hack, day, hack days, etc. Growth structure, that's the fifth part of Marty, the strange looking management model. And uh, I have the example of, uh, of guilds here. Actually, you probably know them as communities of practice. Community of practice is this informal get together of people around a certain area where they discuss their craft. Well, in the past we called them guilds. And actually, I prefer the word guild, because guild, this word guild has this association with craftsmanship. So I prefer to call them business guilds. And actually, at Spotify, the company where I was a couple of uh, months ago, the famous online music uh, giant, they actually call them guilds. They don't like communities of practice. They call them guilds. The teams are called squads. The departments are called tribes. The names are, are, are important for them. And that makes sense to me, too. Speaking of games, some people reminded me that in these virtual worlds like World of Warcraft and League of Legends, people organize themselves in guilds. That's what they like. They don't call it the Wizards Community of Practice. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Or, or the, the, the Center of Excellence for Thieves. <laughs> but <laughs> It's a Thieves Guild, for God's sake. <laughs> so call it a guild. Call it for what it is. It's a guild, not something that sounds bureaucratic and no, that nobody wants to be part of. So, business guilds. And uh, last one, improve everything. Here I have a picture of, uh, of a very interesting wall at the same company where they also had these tiny whiteboards instead of sticky notes. Management made a, a big wall available, black and crayon markers, and told the employees, do whatever you want with it. Make it fun. And one team said, oh, this, this is cool. We're going to use it for the happiness index. We're going to radiate happiness in, in, our, in our team. So they started plotting their, their, their happiness uh, across, uh, across, the over, across the weeks. And apparently, at this point, somebody was very, very unhappy. It was probably oh, cor yeah. correlated with this person who was very, very happy. <laughs> <laughs> totally off the scale. You know, as, <laughs> see, correlation, not causation, of course. That's a, that would be a mistake. Um, I learned that they, they changed it by now because the experiment was not working in all, uh, in all cases. But anyway, they, they experimented, they had fun, and they used a wall that was made available for them by management. In inviting them to do something uh, useful with it. I loved it. So, these are the six views of, of Marty, the management model, all the way from energizing people to, uh, to improve everything. And uh, maybe you've noticed that gamification comes up again and again. Uh, with, with, with kudo cards that you could evolve into merit money, some people uh, uh, have uh, have this 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 uh, these objection objections uh, to me like like what if if people give each other their bonuses then what if they team up and then then they one A gives his bonus to B and B gives his bonus to A I said well wh why don't you why don't you uh, try to make as much as possible transparent and iterate in short in short sprints and use use points instead of money so that you can learn along the way and turn it into a game because that's what it is. It's basically an economy within the office walls. What is wrong with an economy? Economies have to thrive. But yes, bad things will happen. That happens everywhere. Uh, but the current bonus system is demotivating 80% of the people. Well, I'm sure we can do better than 80%. So what if 20% of the people uh, are demotivated with a new system? That's at least 60% better than what we have now. So gamification can, it can be used there, uh, uh, there as well. Same as with all the other, uh, uh, many of the other examples that I just gave. 
And as I said, this is this important for management, not just managers. And hopefully you, really, you realize now that uh, the, the point here from the scientific perspective is to steal healthy practices from others. <laughs> what is working, working elsewhere, that might work for me too. Maybe I have to change it a little bit. Right? And use it in safe to fail experiments. We don't want to bring the whole organization down, so maybe we can experiment with the merit money system on one team and see what happens. Get the wrinkles out before we extend it further. Learn as fast as possible in short increments. Don't do it once per year. Uh, adapt to your need, etc. until now you're smiling for real. And not just faking it. Right? So if you're interested in any of these practices, this is my latest project, as I said, uh, mentioned workout. I have uh, nine by now, hopefully by the end of the year I have about 20, maybe even 25. And uh, I iterate because I publish them and this invites feedback. So people give me stories, they send me photos of actual implementations, and I can use that. So your story or your photo could be in the final version, which will be my next book. And you will be famous. <laughs> Alright? Thank you very much for listening and let's play some more games. <laughs>